add weight, add tools. There's a lot of guys that like they need to get significantly better in 2020 for us to, or for me at least, to get really on board with them as like you know top end talents. Yeah, I, I think the way to describe it. Hundred percent. Also, after we go over the edge group here, it's about 10, 12 guys or whatever it may be. We have an interview with current Baltimore Ravens defensive lineman Clayus Campbell. He's going to be playing a lot more inside this year. He told us that on the interview, but he's played a lot of edge in his career. I think some highlights to tease that interview calls Cameron Jordan one of the best NFL, you know, NFL defensive linemen in the game right now. Super underrated. He's also graded super well at PFF. Another thing he calls out, Laramie Tunsil. I thought what he said about Tunsil and how much he's improved as a young offensive lineman. Same with Taylor Luan. I thought was super impressive. He highlighted some of his favorite offensive linemen. Also, not in the interview. We talked about this after we stopped recording, and I hate it. But he wants to, after he retires, he wants to drop down to 250 or under 250 so he can skydive. That's his goals. Because we were talking about how young uh, Joe Staley, these like offensive linemen who trim down significantly when they retire. I was asking him if he wanted to do that. It's easier said than done, but he wants to skydive. So hopefully he can get into that. But it's a very good interview. I encourage you guys to stay on and listen to that on the back end here. But let's get into this edge group, Mike, and first start with Miami, Florida's Gregory Rousseau. I think the first thing I want to mention with him, freakishly talented. And I feel like they just threw him at any position they wanted last year. Like, he played nose. Like, he played nose last year. He yeah. played inside, on shaded on guards. He played an edge defender. He wore number 15. Like, I mean, this guy was everywhere for that Miami, you know, defense. And, and he had some success. I think there's some games where you can see him dominate because of just pure physical athletic ability. But, again, and I've said this before, too, he's still very raw. Like, you'd like to see more tools, him win with more moves in 2020 to kind of warrant him being like as highly ranked as he is right now by a lot of people. Yeah, this guy was an all-state wide receiver coming out, four-star prospect, <laughs> oh my God. and played Not safety surprised. as well in high school. Switched to defensive line, is six seven, two fifty three, and his arms have to be over thirty six inches long. Like this, Dude, they're he massive. Has, they're so this, long. <laughs> yeah, he has one of the craziest builds I've ever seen for an edge defender. Uh, I mean. It's like Mario Williams esque. I can't remember Mario Williams' exact measurables, but like this guy is just built differently than anyone else, even amongst NFL players. Like, like he makes NFL players look uh, like normal human beings. This guy is, is a freak in every sense of the word, just special movement skills. And, and it's a little inflated. His sack numbers last year, I think he had what, 15, 16 sacks, something like that. Uh, a little inflated. His grade was not nearly on that level. Uh, pass rushing grade just over 80 this past season. But again, he was just kind of scratching the surface. Like he still looked like he was getting the nuances of the defensive line position down. Like he had just switched, you know, to defensive line. He was a wide receiver, like I said, coming out of high school. So this is another guy to where we kind of we touched off the top. Like right now, he's not a top five player in this class. He's not a top ten player in this class. He's not like quite that good, but he could be, and he could be even more special than that. Mm-hmm. No, I'm with you, man. And if you talk about like the learning curve, he also was asked to do a lot of different things. I mean, 336 snaps with his hand to ground, hand in the ground, shaded outside the right tackle. But other than that, he played over 70 snaps at nose tackle, played more than 30 snaps in, at, shaded on or inside the tackle. So like he played a lot of different positions for this defense too, which makes things obviously difficult to kind of attack that learning curve. I think another thing I'll mention too is like you see a ton of cleanup pursuit pressures on his tape. And it's a big reason why he has 46 pressure, 16 sacks, but just an 80.7 PFF passing grade. I think games to watch, in my opinion, where I thought you could kind of see a lot was the Florida State game and also the Virginia game. Virginia, by the way, God bless them. The tackles they trotted out last year are at, like, go watch any <laughs> ACC edge defender or an and Julian Aquara who just absolutely yeah, they ended up throwing three different right tackles at Julian Aquara in that game. Like, it was absolutely absurd. I remember talking to him about that. He's like, dude, they were just like merry-go-round carousel at right tackle because you were just eating their lunch every play. The amount of like defensive linemen you see and you're looking through their grades 
and then you see, oh, there's highest or second highest grade Virginia. <laughs> and you're just like, oh, okay, yes. yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah. I mean, that's just. I mean, even the, like the Marvin Wilson game is another one. Like you turn like even on the interior, like Marvin Wilson like destroyed that Virginia mm-hmm. offensive line. I don't know how that quarterback stayed alive. It, it was it, hard to watch. Interesting thing to note, though, the next guy we're going to talk about here, Chris Rump, Duke mm-hmm. defensive lineman, lowest graded game was against Virginia. Don't know wow. how that one happened, but it was only 14 yeah. pass rushing steps. But it I will say this, though. I will say this, and Rumpf, you know, he's still adding weight. We can kind of use that as a transition. The tie bow on Gregory Rousseau is that I feel like I want to see him play one position a lot more. I want to see him develop a toolbox. And, like, because, like, if he does, he has all the tools in the world to be fantastic, to be great, and, like, be yeah. well warrant the ranking. He's getting, like, top 10, top 15 rankings overall for the 2021 draft. If he had some tools, like, I'm ready to sign up. Like, sign me up. But, again, I, I still want to see it. You know, that pass rushing grade has proven to have a lot of predictive power going from the NCAA to the NFL, and we just haven't seen it yet. And that was his first – but that was his very first college season. Like, he redshirted as a freshman. He's yeah. a redshirt freshman last year. It was the very first time he played D-line at a college football level to – get 16 sacks like you did <laughs> even if some of them were cleaning up sacks pretty ridiculous and it kind of speaks more to just when he does win it is in a blink of an eye in an instant and he closes to the quarterback and has this massive wingspan to chase down qbs that just like he cleans up every time he wins yep all right let's jump to chris rump uh, six listed at six foot three 225 pounds yeah. what playing edge defender for Duke this past year, a 92.9 PFF pass rushing grade, had 14 pressures against the hapless offensive line that Miami, Florida tried it out last year. 14 total pressures. That is an absurd single-game figure. You know, the biggest thing that stands out with him is that, dude, he's got all the tools in the toolbox you want. His dad, I think, is the defensive line coach for either Tennessee or Florida That's State it. right now, Tennessee. And you can tell, similar to, I remember we're talking about Van Jefferson and how his dad was a wide receivers coach and he did all the little things yeah. very well. Chris Rumpf does the little things well, and it's why he can win as a pass rusher against good competition, too, outside of Virginia and Miami, Florida. Uh, so as often as he did, 49 pressures, like I said, a 92.9 pass rushing grade at 225 pounds. This guy is, he is the best defensive lineman in college football. Bar none. He is the best defense lineman in college football at 225 pounds. Like that is how talented (laughs) this guy is with his hands. The most pass rushing moves I've seen from a college football player in the past half decade. Like he just, he can do it all. He like anything you throw at him as an offensive lineman, he has an answer for. Uh, And again, like you mentioned, his dad being outside linebacks coach, he's probably been doing this, you know, since he was a kid. All he really needs to do is add weight. Like, he's very athletic, even for a 225-pounder, very quick, very good with his hands. And what I – he's even more impressive to me. You mentioned his 92.9 pass rusher grade. He had a 90.3 run defense grade. He doesn't look out of place there. Yeah. Taking on blocks one-on-one despite being, you know, the size of a maybe an NFL safety at the moment with how big (laughs) he is. So I just want to see what this guy shows up looking like next year because he's a redshirt junior. So he's, you know – I don't know his exact age, but probably in the 21 to 22 uh, range right now. So uh, you, if he's not going to get up into the 240 range, it's going to be difficult for him to play off the edge in the NFL. But, man, if I've believed in some smaller edges before uh, and thought they could do it and rarely works out, I think if he can just get up to around 240, I think this guy could play in the, edge, in the NFL at that size with just how talented he is. I, I, I truly believe that he just he really has everything you'd want besides size at the position right now. Yeah, I mean, I'd be interested to get him on the podcast and talk to him about how many calories he's housing during quarantine. Because I'm yes. telling you right now, if that coach isn't telling him to go all you can eat every single day, it's a problem because he needs to add weight. Looking at kind of his snap, you know, where he lined up this past year, 280 snaps along the defensive line with the bulk majority of those hand in the ground, edge defender outside the tackles. He also played over 120 snaps at off-ball linebacker, played in the box a little bit, specifically in weeks 7, 8, 9, and 11, playing some off-ball linebacker blitzing there. I, what I don't want, and Mike, Correct me if I'm wrong. What I don't want is for him not to for him to not put enough weight on to where you have to play him in this kind of hybrid role. Because like there's only only there's only a handful of NFL defenses that actually take advantage of those guys. Like nine times out of ten, they end up like flaming out because they're not like it's so hard to take advantage of those types if you're not like Bill Belichick with Kyle Van Oy, Dante Hightower. This year it's gonna be Josh Uche. Like the it, there aren't defensive coordinators that know how to use people like Chris Rumpf. Say he only gets up to two thirty five or whatever it may be. 
And he's also too talented as a pass rusher. Like I said, he has more moves than any other guy I've seen in the past. Decade. He, like, he's too good at taking out blocks to waste as an off-ball linebacker. Like, True. Uh, he is too – he has a and – the, and the thing that makes me believe in him being able to do it versus, like I said, I believe in some smaller, undersized guys in the past who have fizzled out in the NFL. He has multiple – and not just, you know, like probably five to ten – Long arm bull rushes on his tape where he's just like throwing an offensive lineman back into yes, yes. the quarterback. Like he can bull rush offensive lineman at two twenty five. That's you don't see that for we question that for guys who are two hundred and forty pounds. We're gonna talk about Quincy Roche in a second here, who was one of the highest graded uh, edge defenders in college football last year. He doesn't have a bull rush pressure on his tape all last season though at, at two hundred and thirty five pounds. So uh, if you're able to do that the way he is, uh, I, I think that's the thing that makes me believe he can do it in the league. Before we jump to Quincy Roche, I don't want to move past this guy, uh, Carlos Basham, the, the Wake yeah. Forest edge defender, six foot five, two seventy five. We brought him up during the season last year on the Two for One Drafts podcast. Talked about him as a potential candidate to come in for the twenty twenty NFL draft and earned a ninety point six PFF pass rushing grade this past year. Has a ton of snaps under his belt, over a thousand pass rushing snaps over the past three years. And this past year, obviously his best one, sixty pressures, eleven sacks, a ninety point six pass rushing grade. He's got built in a lab type of body and build. And like you see six foot five, two seventy five, you're kind of expecting slow get off, not super explosive. But I thought he had some juice on tape. Like I don't think I would not categorize him as a not explosive edge defender. I think he could actually get off the ball a bit. Yeah, there are two guys that throw in the first round right now. One's Russo just because of how just special his physical Freaky. tools are. <laughs> and the other one's Basham. He, you know what? I, I'll I'll say this right now. Here's the take with Russo. Russo is a is a Jadavion Clowney Michigan hit away from being like a lock. <laughs> like the, like yeah. if he breaks in the backfield and just blows somebody up, it's like, oh man, that's that's all it's gonna take because he's got similar freakish ability. Yeah, he's like a hype train that's just like ready to get started. Like he just exactly. needs one thing to get that train going out the building. But Basham to me is just a guy who needs to kind of realize who he is and, and where he went. He is 6'5", 275, but I think he runs a little hot and cold because sometimes he wants to play like a guy who's 6'4", 240. Like, sometimes he wants to – because he is quick. Like, he is quicker than your average 6'5", 270-pound guy. He has a good get-off. He has – he looks twitchy, even for a guy that size. Like, he's the same size as someone like Quiddy Pie, who we're going to get to a little later here. And just they are – look like different – Quiddy Pie, a very good athlete at that size. Carlos Basham looks just, like, twitchier, looks more agile. You just see this difference in the way he plays. But I think Basham just needs to realize that, hey, when you're that big, when you're that strong, when you're that explosive, you need a bull rush and one counter off that bull rush. And you can dominate college offense tackles and even NFL offensive tackles if you just perfect those moves. And I think we kind of saw that at the comp for him that I've said, been saying since last year. It's Marcus Davenport with the Saints. You just yes, perfect that. Comment. And I think you saw that this past year with Davenport. You just perfect that. And don't try to ever get too cute with it. Don't try to be someone you're not. And I think Carlos Basham is going to be a good one at the NFL level. All right, let's jump to someone you mentioned, Quincy Roche. So the former Temple edge defender transferred to Miami this year, partnering up with Gregor Rousseau, so, where that pass rush would be pretty lethal. But looking at Quincy, Quincy Roche, his stats this past year, like absolutely dominated at Temple, like played at a super high level, one of the highest pass rushing grades in 2019. But like you said, you don't see a bull rush on his tape, like still still re- very heavily reliant on that speed and that outside rush. Yeah, he's a guy uh, who was very much reliant on just the fact that he's, he's fairly long. So he's six foot four. Uh, he has length and he is just very good at reading offensive tackles. They overset, you know, you're facing some some shittier off tackles and Tulane, USF, and who are trying to trying to deal with the fact that he's more athletic than them. They overset and he's good at dipping back inside. They don't, and all of a sudden he goes and gets the corner on them, but he's not going through you. He's not going to win with power. He's not going to set a hard edge in the running game. So I just another guy I just need to see him get bigger. I need to see a power aspect to his game that can at least threaten offensive tackles. But he has uh, I mean, he was very dominant. 93.3 pass rushing grade, 68 pressures, 13 sacks, 13 hits, 42 hurries. Uh, but another guy, he, he's old. He's a graduate transfer here. This is his fifth year in college. Uh, yeah. It, it, I'm not sure if you're still 235 pounds now, if that's ever going to get bigger, if you're ever going to add that to your game. 
that's the concern. And obviously you just can't afford to see a drop off in pass rushing production going from Temple to Miami, Florida. Like I don't want this to be a Mike Dana situation where yeah. Mike Dana transferred from Central Michigan to yeah. Michigan and his pass rushing production fell off a cliff. Like if that happens for Roche, like it's that is that is a death knell. Because that yeah. shows that an increase in competition is going, you know, when you go from Miami to the NFL, you're only going to continue to see like a downward spiral a bit. And I'll also say, we, I I like Rump because I think he is explosive and uh, like I, I think he's a more explosive athlete than Ro- Roche. Like I, I do think that Roche is just like middling. Even when he gets to 240 pounds, he's not going to be, you know, like a 4'6 guy. Like he is just going to be kind of an average run of the mill athlete by edge standards. And that's just worrisome uh, when projected to the NFL. All right, let's jump to Aiden Hutchinson, the Michigan edge defender, six foot six, listed at six foot six, two hundred sixty eight pounds. You see that beef off the edge. He does not look like Chase Winovich coming off the edge, where you saw like legit explosiveness. He's a bigger dude. I think before the podcast, you made a comp to Zach Allen, the former Boston College and now current Arizona Cardinal defensive lineman. I think this guy plays inside at the next level. Like, you don't want this guy on the edge at the next level, right? It depends on kind of your scheme. But he, like I said, 6'6", 278, uh, only getting bigger, though. Like, he was only a true sophomore last year. Yeah, that guy's adding some beef. I bet you he he plays a lot more inside this year. Yeah, he's probably going to be up into that 3-4 defensive end type of body. And and he has an ideal body for that. And I think the way he wins is ideal for that. He's a guy who is going to control every single interaction, is going to move the line of scrimmage on every single play, whether it's run game, pass game. He is going to get into your pads, and then he's going to work from there. We saw him beat up on Tristan Wirfs a little bit in that Iowa game. Uh, I, I mean, there wasn't like an offensive lineman that really got the better of him. Like He is just a consistent control of interactions. I, I don't think he's a bad athlete, but again, he's not a special athlete by any means. So he's a guy who right now, is very po- like very polished for a sophomore. I just don't know where he takes his game next year. Yeah. Uh, he, he could. The ceiling like, is low. Uh, that's just the thing. I'm not sure where his ceiling can push at this point. But again, like I, I think he's. I, I think there's a path to him being a very productive uh, NFL player. Uh, it, it's just going to probably take him getting just even bigger. Like that guy. Those guys can win when they're 295 on the interior. Uh, at three technique a lot more consistently than I think they can than when you're out on the edge. I would agree 100%. I, I would imagine he's adding weight, continuing to add weight, and potentially seeing more snaps inside. I think you brought up two great points there. One, you know, like when you're chasing that ceiling at edge defender, you need athleticism. You need the jet pack mm-hmm. off the get off. And we talking to Der- Dr. Eric Eager and how predictive kind of athleticism at edge defender is going from, you know, college to the NFL in terms of dictating success. Like, athleticism matters at that position you need to have you know top flight athleticism to be you know that special pass rusher in the nfl and two i think another thing that you brought up was um oh man i thought i had two points there but i guess i missed it but oh control talking about control like i think that is a a word that comes up a ton with him like he even has some reps where he controls maybe doesn't flat out beat but controls the line of scrimmage against tristan worse and i think that comes with just sheer power and i think the polish you speak to all I, I, and, and it kind of goes back to the conversation we had about AJ Nessa coming out, being like, hey, if he gets bigger and goes in the interior, we think he could be a much, much better player than if he's just your base 4-3 defensive end. Yep. All right, let's jump to Clemson's Xavier Thomas. I believe a former five-star recruit. This guy was decorated coming out of high school, and you kind of see that special ability. Six foot two, 265. He played in a completely different role this past year, and I know you spoke to that a handful of times. What kind of impact did that have on his game? I know his pass rushing grade dropped significantly. Yeah, so if you think back to that 18 team that had Cleveland Furl, uh, you know, Christian Wilkins, uh, Dexter Lawrence, they attacked like that was a four three attacking get up field get after the quarterback sort of defense this past year it was a lot more three man fronts he had his hand in the dirt inside a lot more xavier thomas did and it was a lot more uh, when you know a lot more blitzing getting home with the pressure of the guys coming on the back end because it was that three one seven it was you know all these guys lined up all over the place. And then a lot of times he was just contain rushing or rushing, shooting one gap to make it so that someone could loop around for, uh, to get home on a stunt or something like that. So he didn't have near the opportunity that he did as a freshman to just attack and go one-on-one against offensive tackles. And he is a classic four, three defensive end body. He is six, two, 265. The guy is built to rush one-on-one, uh, with a little space off the edge. 
He is not an he's not a guy you want really kicking in on the interior, and, and he's not a guy who's necessarily going to uh, be a contain rusher. It's just not going to be where you want him. It's not going to be his best role at the next level. So we took a step back in terms of grading effectiveness, but I think the power in his hands is still there. You still saw reps on his tape where that natural talent is there. I just want to know what the Clemson defense is going to look like this year. Is it going to give him those opportunities again? Uh, because I, I think he needs that for his draft stock here. You, you need to see opportunities with his ears pinned back off the edge. Like that's yeah. like that's the bottom line. I, I, I would agree with that. All right, let's jump to. Um, you've been calling him Quitty Pie. Is it Quitty Pay or Quitty Pie? I think it's Quitty Pay. Resources. I'm like the worst of, with pronunciations. <laughs> I just see see something once. I think I don't listen to announcers when I watch games just because there's. I, I don't like listening to announcers, like, no matter what. I wouldn't even listen to Chris. Like, I watch Sunday Night Football, and I'll have Chris muted. So, and he's my boss. Wow. So, I just don't tell. enjoy listening to announcers. And then I'll just, like, get a name in my head, and I'll pronounce it that way, no matter what, and never look it up. So, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. We probably mm-hmm. should look it up at some point. But I say Quiddy Quid Pay. I think it's Quiddy Pay. I think it's Quiddy okay. Pay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to that. But to, to talk about Quiddy Pay for a little bit, I think you see some of the standout production. And, like, when I was looking back, I thought – you know, like what I thought this guy would be a better, more heavily recruited because I think you see yeah. some athleticism that you didn't expect knowing that he was just listed, according to 24 7 Sports, as a three star recruit this past year, a 77.8 pass rushing grade turn on that Iowa game. Like you can see, you can see it against Tristan Worst. You can see that he can win those. And then um, Brad Kelly, an analyst for Cover One, he's a big Rhode Island guy. And apparently, Quiddy Pay reigns from Rhode Island. And, and he listened to the podcast where we brought him up previously and talked about how. He was the anchor on the state championship 4 by 100 team, ran in, the, ran in 11 seconds, one state one state in a long jump, hitting 22 feet. Only a three-star because of Rhode Island and the size of the state necessarily is kind of what he mentioned. Then also, he played yeah, running back. That's, with- I mean, that's a lot of – that's where I grew up. It's just like it's not an area that's heavily recruited. And I remember yeah. uh, Mike Hullis Shore, the former Lions running back, is from there, and he was just like – he was a three-star. But, like, everyone knew, like, this guy was – different than a three-star like it was yeah yeah, it was a freak of nature but it was only a three-star recruit because it just i mean you don't go to camps and you don't you don't get seen when you're at a small when you're playing a small school yeah and apparently i mean he was born in war-torn liberia and then like moved to south providence after that like he's not even from the united states and he played running back in the wishbone in high school and went for 895 yards 21 touchdowns on 63 carries 14 0.2 0.2 yards per carry. So this guy is a lot more special than maybe the stars would suggest. All that info, he DM'd me. Brad Kelly DM'd me and sent me that after we talked about him recently on the pod. So very interesting stuff for Quiddy Pay. Um, like I said, this past year, a career year for him, 77.8 pass rushing grade on 316 snaps. How does he need to get better for him to enter that conversation of one of the top edge defenders in this class? So he's a big, another big dude. Like I said, he's almost the same size as Carlos Basham. I mean, he's He's not too far. I, I said Basham's a better athlete. He's not too far. Like they're they're similar levels of athlete. Like he is a very explosive guy for his size, but he really just like and and you see it when he hits a guy, they move backwards. Like on contact consistently is when he wins. He's really in that pass rushing moves right now. Like he his pass rushing move is to try to hit you in the chest and hope that he hits it you hard you enough back. that you're not yeah hit you hard enough that he's going to be able to get free. He just does not have a, a full toolbox. He doesn't have much more than that. It's either he's shooting a gap uh, and trying to just you know use that raw explosiveness to get to the quarterback, or he's trying to play right through your chest. There's not much more. He's not trying to swat your hands away. He doesn't have a refined skill set. But the fact that he was already productive, you know, 83.4 run defense grade, 77.8 pass rush grade this past season as a true junior, uh, that he was already productive doing that is encouraging. Just another guy. We need to see more. He, he's in a, he's one of the guys that I was mentioning. Like, he could push his way in the first round conversation. I could see him having a monster year. Oh, one hundred percent. Taking that next step with how athletic he is, but we just need to see it at this point. All right, let's jump to a Michigan rival, Ohio State. Tyree Smith, 
talk about not playing a lot. This guy has only played only 254 pass rushing snaps over the past few years, only 140 this past year. Didn't play more than 20 pass rushing snaps in any single game. Talk about, I mean, and I think you need to get hot. You need, you, you need some, you need some snaps to really get hot and, and understand moves and, and w- set up things yeah. as a pass rusher, if you're going to make plays. But I do think you see some reps. I think I saw a handful of reps against Cincinnati. We're like, okay, there's some, there's some special ability here. Listed at six foot four, 255 pounds and earned a 74.7 pass rushing grade this past year on limited snaps show me more and i'm banking on the recruiting background the athleticism the size and the experience translating into at least at the very least a better year and this guy's still very young so ohio state's actually updated that he's 267 now Uh oh so Uh-oh. he's putting on he's getting he's getting some mass up there and you and like you said you see the reps you see reps that just some of these guys that even some of the guys we've touched on before earlier in this podcast can't make like he does things. He had a hump move uh, against Wisconsin in the run game where it just takes a special blend of strength uh, and power to execute a hump move. You're not, you're not going to be uh, who, who's someone we already hit. You're not going to be Chris Rump and do a hump move. Like, like I said, he has a ton of pass rushing moves. He's not going to be able to execute a hump move. That, that's just, it takes, you have to, that's just a completely, I'm stronger than you move to get yourself free. So you see some of those reps on his tape, special level athlete. But again, we just need to see more. 140 pass rushing snaps all last season. Uh, really never got going in games. And what I do love, though, about Ohio State, and you see it on Tyreek Smith's tape all the time, is they read offensive tackles. They are not just, he's not just flying off the ball and executing his move that he had pre planned. He is reading what's in front of him. And if you guys haven't seen this, who are listening and haven't seen Urban Meyer breaking down how they teach pass rushing at Ohio State, it was on. Uh, the Fox pregame show last year. It was fantastic to watch about what they do. And they, they teach them based what you're going to do off of what the offensive lineman is doing. And, and uh, you see this again and again, Tyreek Smith's tape. And that's what translates, in my opinion, to the NFL. And that's what makes good pass rushers, just being able to read and react. And the fact that he's already doing that and doing it consistently as a true sophomore. 74.7 pass rushing grade last year with his tools. Uh, I think we're going to see a pretty big year from him. He's a guy who I think... Again, it's not in the first round right now. I think we're going to end up talking about him in the first round at some point. And especially as the helmet scouts get in there, you're going to start seeing that hype come up. But I do, I do but think, I think though, it's real at Ohio State again with how. Yeah, they, no, it has to be. It person. has to be. I mean, you've. I remember when we before the 2019 season, you're bringing up Chase Young on a limited sample size. Like, dude, what is that? Especially when uh, Nick Bosa ended up leaving and he saw more playing time. Like, oh man, like you see it with Chase Young. He had a higher grade than Smith, but still, I think we'll see that. All right, one of my, one of my, not a. Not a hidden gem necessarily. I think a lot of people are on this guy, but I was really impressed with his tape compared to some of the other guys we'll bring up. It's Jason Owe, the edge defender from Penn State. Let's jump to him. And I think he immediately, you start, you know, because you see him on the same field at some reps, like immediately stands out a lot more than Etor Gross Matos did. Six foot five, 247, can actually, here's what I saw, can actually bend the edge, like bend the edge and make plays on the quarterback. You saw the athleticism on the get off, an 81.8. Pass rushing grade on just 207 pass rush snaps this past year, 31 pressures. The Michigan State game is a very good one. The Purdue game, another one to watch. Indiana, you see it. Like Jason Owe, I think, a younger dude, again, uh, you know, uh, an underclassman, if you will, um, will will be a guy that gets a lot better and I think gets some more praise in 2020. Yes, he's another guy. Wouldn't put in the first round now, but man, he's close. Oh, yeah. And six foot five, 257, he reportedly... Ran. Uh-oh. Do you know what his 40 reportedly is? Is it like Aquara levels, like 415 or something ridiculous? 433 <laughs> three reportedly. Jeez. 40. Oh and so he doesn't play quite that twitchy. Like he, it, he's not just, he doesn't look like a cornerback playing edge. But no. you see that when like he gets free and the quarterback's trying to break out, he gets there. Man, he he, like his speed is pretty absurd. I don't know if I buy 433, but he, he does look different than even any of these other guys we're talking about in terms of just closing to the quarterback and he's pretty slippery off the edge. Like you said, he can bend the edge when he gets there, when guys get his hands on him, he can still get himself free. And he's a guy who's just only scratching the surface. He only played 65 snaps as a freshman, 332 this past year, uh, but still under 81.8 pass rushing grade. Almost the same as Etor Gross Matos. I-, I think we could see a monster year from Oway oh, yeah. uh, in 2020. And-, and this guy, he has some, he has some freakish ability, uh, and like I said, not four three three is not quite how he plays, 
but you see you see some athleticism and some power there that other guys just don't have. And I remember when we were bringing up and talking about Itor Gross Matos, and PFF was notably lower on Gross Matos than some others were, and even the NFL was, was that you never saw him dominate games. You know, you wanted to see him take over. With Owe, he can do that. Like you've seen him like, oh man, I'm going to take over. Like, I'm dominating the opposition, and that's what you want. You need, you always yeah, say Michigan, this, runner, Michigan and it State sticks game. with me. The Michigan State game you saw. Like, this sticks game. with me, so you have to see it. You know, with rookies, with young players, like you have to see it that they can reach that ceiling and at least in bursts, at least in reps, before you can feel confident that they can reach that high end consistently. And I think you've already kind of seen it with Owe, and I can imagine this year will be very good, um, if if not significantly improved. All right, jumping to Joe Tryon, the Washington edge defender. This guy's getting some hype early on, an older player, I think. Right, he'll, he's entering he's, his senior season. He's a season. Redshirt, redshirt junior, so yeah. Redshirt junior, okay, red, yeah. entering his redshirt senior season. But talk to me about Joe Tryon. So Tryon, 6'5", 262, and has some – he's thick. Like he, he looks – he's got ideal – that's like an ideal edge build, not undersized by any means, has good length, really high motor player. This guy you saw just never quit on any plays. 613 snaps last year. So Washington he breeds season. that, though. Danny yeah, Shelton, Vita it. Vea, like uh, Hayuli It's a high motor Kaha. culture. Like, it's yeah. just like so much yeah. high motor culture. But he's almost like, he's almost out of control the way he plays. He is a high motor, and he's not really nuanced. There's not a lot of nuance to his game. He's kind of just see ball, get ball. I'm going to go 100 miles per hour towards the ball and try to go through you. Uh, from going around you, I might just be flailing my arms wildly and not actually executing any sort of technique whatsoever. Uh, and, and he's not nearly as fluid as some of the other guys we've talked about on this list. Like he, he's not a guy like Owe. You said it's going to bend the edge. He's not that type of uh, edge defender. But I think there is a path to where he can be you know, a productive NFL player with just the fact that he's fairly explosive and has a motor that will not quit. And it's going to you know, give 100% every single snap. But only a 71.7 pass rush grade this past year as a redshirt sophomore. So uh, there's still a ways for him to go. He may not even be a guy who comes out after his redshirt junior. He may, yeah. he may be a guy who plays all five seasons there. Because I don't love those types. You know, like, I mean, those are types that you draft day two, day three. You know, like guys that yeah, like high motor, yeah. relentless, uncontrolled. Like, okay, you're not winning consistently. You haven't won consistently at the college level. But, I mean, it, this is obviously a year for him to potentially improve. And so forth. All right, jump bottom of the barrel here. Last four guys we'll mention on the edge defender class, and then we'll jump to that Calais Campbell interview. Jamar Watson, you you came away un, unimpressed with Jamar Watson's tape, or how, how did you phrase it? So he, I came into watching his tape, and I looked at his grades, and he had an eighty-one point four pass rushing yes. grade, twenty eighteen, eighty-nine point five in twenty nineteen. This is at Kentucky, playing SC competition. And usually you're not getting at Kentucky, you're not winning. So they don't have a lot of great pass rushing opportunities. So to grade that well, when you're not leading a lot of games is, I was expecting impressive, but man, he's just, he's so herky jerky. He's on the undersized already. And he's a uh, senior, he's going to be a senior this year, six foot three, 248 pounds. So he's undersized still not particularly explosive, not really any power to his game. You saw him get moved off the line of scrimmage in the run game consistently. Did not grade out well there. Only 66.6 run defense grade in 2019. It's just like the herky-jerkiness is too much to get over. It reminds me of Montez Sweat as a pass rusher. Not, not, nothing more so than just the way they rush the passer. It's just something feel, felt off about it. Even though it it would grade out well and get home sometimes. It just doesn't doesn't look like what you see at the NFL level from productive pass rushers. So I, I'm not I'm not super high in Jamar Watson, despite the fact that 89.5 pass rushing rate in the SEC. I, I, that that looks like it should be you know a possible first rounder. I wouldn't even put him in the day two conversation though right now. Yeah, that is tough. And you're looking at like kind of his games where he earned those high grades. South Carolina in week five, five total pressures and 90.3. Pass session grade, and then at Arkansas, a 91.5 pass session grade. That is, the other seven. Thing, that is the other thing to mention, though, is that he only rushed the passer 172 times. He dropped into coverage 107. He's playing 3 4 outside linebacker in Kentucky. And so that's he's only really rushing the passer, obvious pass rush situations, getting good looks at it. So that's fine. Next guy on the list is Patrick Jones, kind of a PFF darling from a grading standpoint, uh, playing at Tulane. But 
I don't. No, this I is didn't... Patrick Jones, the Pittsburgh. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Patrick Jones from Pittsburgh. Sorry, six foot five, two sixty. I don't know why I said two million. Um, but uh, an eighty four point two pass rushing grade this past year. Uh, sixty two total pressures, like easily a career year for him this past year, and played four hundred fifteen pass rushing snaps as well. So he's six foot five, two sixty. Good length. You know, that's like the build you want off the edge. Just not twitchy whatsoever. Watching his tape, if if he's if he slows down at all. It just takes him forever to get back up to speed. I, I just don't know if he has the athleticism to hack it in the league, to, to be anything other than a depth piece in the NFL. He really is just at that level. And, and the stats were great. Like I said, 62 pressures last year. He could, he's very good with his hands. He's hand placement, gets in the guy's chest, a good run defender as well. But I just worry about is he consistently going to be able to one, you know, bull rush even at that size with no explosiveness, and two, uh, win to the edge. I don't, I don't think so at this point. So, I mean, it's such a we'll turnoff when you, when you pop on the tape and you see a guy that's graded well, you see good numbers, and then you immediately see like no explosion or you know next to no explosion. Yeah. It's like okay, I understand the type that he is, and winning. It's not so much that it's it's negative. You know, winning at that winning earning eighty four ninety plus pass rushing grades at any level is impressive, but knowing that you're winning without explosiveness, without that top end athleticism, it, it already puts you in the back of your mind thinking about trying to make that transition to the NFL and just how much harder it is mm-hmm. to be productive when you don't have those tools, when you don't have you know those that special ability. All right, Malcolm Kuntz. This guy graded super well this past year at Buffalo. A couple guys from Buffalo graded really well along the defensive line. I wonder mm-hmm. if there was some bias in those grades. No, but I mean, Kuntz is, a, I mean, another guy where, I don't know, pop on the tape, and I, I did not come away super impressed, as impressed you would be with the pass rushing grade. 53 pressures, an 89.6 pass rushing grade. You just didn't see it like you did with some of these other guys. Yes, Kuntz, he's on the smaller side, six foot three, 250. He's going to be a senior this year, but he also took a prep year, so he's on the older side. And again, I, I, the grade's great. It comes in flashes against real bad competition. It, it, and when he faces – a guy when he faces, you know, better offensive tackles who can match to that. The one thing I did like though is that for a smaller guy, uh, he's comfortable playing at an angle, he's comfortable going to the bull rush consistently. Like that was one of his better moves. So there is something there, but again, he it never really turned on until you know he was older. It, it is, he had a seventy five point one pass rush grade in twenty eighteen then jumped big up to 89.6 this past year, but he was already on the older side. I know the development curve is different for everybody, but you'd like to see the guys that are better earlier on in their careers. Dominator rating. You need that dominator yeah. rating and edge defender. Uh, well, when you're going against worse bad competition, it's kind of like that you should. You know? Yeah, you should be dominating. Absolutely. Dominator. <laughs> uh, this last guy, I did not know you were going to be throwing this guy on the list here. I have not watched any of him, and I don't even know if I'll be able to pronounce his name. Hammy Clark. Rashad Jr., Oregon State. Hamilcar. Hamilcar is probably Hamilcar. What the hell did I just say? Hamilcar, Rashad Jr., this past year, over 600 snaps played, um, a 79.4 overall grade for Oregon State. Talk to me about this guy. I have no idea who the fuck this guy is. So he had 15 sacks last year, and that's going to obviously put you on the radar for yeah. as a pass rusher. But he is 6'4", 238. And so he's way undersized, and he has no power to his game whatsoever. He looks he looks skinnier than 238. The guy looks about 225. He just does not look like an edge defender. And he is the edge defender you worry about with the way he wins. And it's a lot of inside moves, a lot of beating guys with pure agility and not necessarily his hands. And he is pretty agile for that size. He can you know, get from one side of you to the other in a hurry – but that's not something that, in my opinion, wins quickly, wins well in the NFL. He is a one, yeah. one move pass rusher, like one executes one move, and then there's no comboing to it. He didn't actually even grade out well despite those you know, 15 sacks, only 77.5 pass rushing grade, only 35 total pressures. He just was not a consistent pass rusher. But when he did win, it was quickly, and he'd get home because he is that agile, you know, undersized guy. But to me, I, I wouldn't touch him. I mean, until six, seventh round. This is not yeah. a this is not a guy who I think is even worth the project, even at that age. 
or even because he is that age, he's going to be a redshirt senior this year and still hasn't gotten his weight up. Those are all very worrisome things in my eyes. Gotcha. Don't believe just the sacks. All right, that's going to do it for the 2021 Edge Defender class overview. We're going to go ahead and jump now to the Calais Campbell interview. Next week's pod, we're going to be going into your defensive line, talking Marvin Wilson and company. It's another group where – not a ton of not not a lot of super impressive players, but Marvin Wilson has graded super well, kind of an arm and a leg better than some of the other guys we'll mention. But it'll be an interesting podcast. We're working to get an interview, potentially Justin Tuck, potentially Damon Harrison. Working to get uh, one of those guys mentioned. You'll have to tune in next week to find out. But thanks again for listening, guys. Uh, let's jump to Calais Campbell. Go you know, defensive line play and defensive line talent. I want to talk about from what you've seen in the offseason so far, what do you think, you know, the virtual OTAs, the virtual workouts, the Zoom meetings, I'm sure you've been a part of a lot of those. Do you think there's going to be any legitimate impact on the NFL season from having to do these virtual training workouts, et cetera? I think the, the, word, the people who are going to miss out the most are the rookies, young guys. Mm -hmm. But um, old vets, this is where you should have a chance to really shine. You know, it shouldn't really be a big issue just because, I mean, uh, I know what to do to get ready. You know, most guys who've been around for a while, they know what to do to get ready for the bodies and stuff. So it's really the young guys who, you know, try to learn systems. I mean, I guess changing teams and learn new playbook and stuff. But, you know, I feel like I got a good grasp of the Ravens playbook already. So I'm excited. So we, we talked a little before you came on here about working out, you know, with Corona, not being able to get in the gym, not being able to do all that stuff. How has it changed your offseason routine and maybe some of the other guys uh, what have they been doing to get their bodies, you know, keep in shape, get to be in peak physical shape for the season? What have you guys been up to? <laughs> yeah, I think like what well, you think most of the gyms are closed. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the guys are uh, just trying to do what they can do, you know, being creative. You know, I think that uh, for me, I kind of worked out on my own anyway uh, during the off season. So I, I, I really, uh, you know, I mean, I found a field I could work out and do some stuff. But most of the stuff I did was in my own building, just being creative. But, uh, you know, I feel like, I mean, I'm in great shape, uh, you know, had a killer workout this morning. You know, I'm feeling real good right now. Nice, man. And so you talk about, you know, obviously changing teams this offseason, trading to the Baltimore Ravens. How much have you been able to glean of the culture? Because everyone speaks to in Baltimore this past season, in addition to the absurd talent they had in Lamar Jackson, Mark Ingram, et cetera, the culture in Baltimore is really what moved the team forward. What have you, you know, gleaned, even though it's just Zoom meetings, what have you, yeah, what have you been surprised by or impressed by from uh, Baltimore Ravens? Well, I think that uh, the coaching staff does a really good job. I mean, I think we tried to really take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, so, uh, you know, I talked to other guys, my friends around the league. I don't think as many teams are doing as much as we're doing uh, as far as just like, I mean, really, uh, you know, going a deep dive into the playbook, uh, the workouts. And then on top of that uh, is just, uh, I mean, interaction with the players and stuff. I mean, the coaches have done a really good job of, of really building that, that, that team chemistry as best they can virtually. But I think it's been, been great. And we've had a lot of, you know, speakers come in and talk to us. So it's been, it's been real cool. So we're a rookie and draft focused podcast. And you were saying the rookies are the guys who are going to have the hardest transition. This is what, this is putting them behind the eight ball more than anyone else. What was the biggest, I guess, learning curve for you at the beginning of career of your career? Cause you famously, you're peaking in your thirties. Your best seasons have been recently <laughs> Uh, according to our PFF grading system. So it took you a while to really get to your peak. What, what for you was the biggest learning curve when you get to the NFL coming from college? Yeah, I mean, going back and looking at it, you know, uh, I thought I was a lot better than I really was in college. <laughs> <laughs> I went back and watched some of my, uh, my own uh, college tape. I mean, I went back and watched every game. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, you saw flashes. You know, you saw me take over games and moments. You know, but I feel like uh, when you get to the NFL, like, you have to be consistent. You know, you just literally – Every play, you know, take care of the small details and try to dominate each matchup. I felt like earlier in my career, I was uh, I was okay with making plays in moments, you know. And then as I got more mature and more older, I started trying to do the best I could in every moment, you know. Like, I mean, I literally would try to break down, you know, uh, and try to affect the play, you know, from, uh, from, you know, if I'm on the backside of the play, I'm chasing it down, taking proper angles, you know, uh, trying to work with, you know, with the cuts back. You know, for the front side, you know, you know, when to tag, when to, you know, set the edge. Just learning, the, you know, I feel like my mind got a lot better. But I feel like the biggest learning curve really is just the consistency. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you know, looking – I wish – I hope I peak in my 30s, by the way. I'm hoping I can get, <laughs> get peaked in my 30s. But I want to talk more about, you know, what you think makes – and you speak to consistency, but I'd be interested to know other traits and characteristics that you think make a good defensive lineman, defensive tackle, or even defensive end. And I think looking at you, you obviously have rare – athletic ability and rare size six foot eight 300 pounds very long arms and obviously that helps but I mean is that a lot of it is it also some other things as well yeah when I look at young guys and I, and I don't know why I like to just evaluate myself just to see what happens <laughs> uh but uh I like to see guys who play violent violent hands you know uh explosive out of their stance you know um I feel like you know you really you can't lose if you uh if you, if you make first contact and you run your feet and you're just violent with your hands and so for young guys, I think most of the time they try to they try to see too much, you know, and, they, and when you see too much, it kind of makes you play slower. And so I feel like, uh, you know, when guys usually, you know, get in a good stance and fire out and strike with violin with their hands, especially in the run game, I feel like that plays a big difference. You know, when you get to the pass rush, you can be, you know, people have different styles, you know, uh, how to get off the ball and, you know, their different moves and stuff. But just, I mean, having a bag of tricks, you know, uh, and usually having to counter off of it, you know, try to make everything look the same. Are there any guys that you watch even on tape yourself being like trying to glean some, like you said, your bag of tricks, trying to add some more tools to your two box, toolbox? Yeah, honestly, uh, I think my game actually took advantage. It really took off when I started studying other guys. You know, I never really studied other guys until about year seven. And when I started studying, you know, uh, other guys that, you know, people would say were really good, you know, I was trying to see what the common denominators were. So I started studying, you know, even old, old players, you know, like the Reggie Whites and Bruce Smith's. When I started studying JJ and Aaron Donald and, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Cam Jordan and uh, Julius Peppers and some of the other guys that were, who were stars. And I was trying to see what, you know, what was in their game that was, that was special. And I think that really just kind of opened my eyes and been like, oh, okay, you know, I could add this, I could add that. You know, some of the stuff they do, I can't do. Some of the stuff I do, they can't do in a sense. But for the most part, you know, I just wanted to see what the, what the standard was. So I think that's really it's starting to study my peers and then study myself too. I, I started studying myself a lot more intense. Before, you know, we kind of dive into who you think some of the better defensive linemen in the NFL are, I want to ask you specifically about Josh Allen, you know, the Jacksonville Jaguars edge defender rookie this past season. What was your opinion of him in your, in your first year with him and his first year in the NFL? He graded super well at Kentucky at the collegiate level, according to PFF, and we feel very confident about his potential. I'd love to know being in the locker room with him and kind of grooming him. What's your opinion of Josh Allen? Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, he's a ridiculous athlete, but he also is hungry for knowledge. And uh, so I feel like, you know, he, he puts the work in. I mean, every day after practice, you know, he, he's doing extra stuff, working on his hand placement, working on his get off, uh, bending, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, it's really that stuff. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, everybody has some talent. And some guys are more talented than others, but in the NFL, talent is kind of, it's pretty close. Uh, mm -hmm. What separates guys is the work ethic, and uh, they're willing to make the small details. And uh, Josh is a guy who's just scratching the surface. I mean, he's putting the work in. He's working to be, uh, you know, to be the best ever. And so he has that chance. I mean, what he did this year, it was it was great to see, you know. But I mean, he's still young, and he's still just yeah. learning. <laughs> it hasn't clicked yet up, up here all the way, you know. And uh, for me, as you know, I had my best career. I mean, you said earlier about my, my game has gotten better as I got a lot smarter and my body's held up where I can still go out there and, and do some things. And so it just comes naturally, but he's going to be, uh, he, he has a chance. If he can stay healthy and continue to develop like I know he will, uh, he has a chance to threaten that 200, that Bruce Smith put up there. <laughs> Obviously, there's a ton, you speak to a ton of different styles in the NFL, specifically as a pass rusher, but if you had to highlight some of the best defensive linemen in the game right now, who, who, would, you, who would some name? what would some names come to mind for you? You know, the guy that I like the most that doesn't get a lot of credit is Cam Jordan. You know, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I respect the whole, the whole concept of the game. You know, to me, like, you know, a lot of guys really concentrate on trying to be good pass rushers because that's where you get paid. I mean, that's where the money is. That's mm -hmm. where the, you know, the fame and everything is. But to me, like, I respect the all-around complete player, run game, you know, uh, when he can't get a good pass rush, understanding when to get his hands up, when to, uh, you know, just you know, push the pocket, both speed, power, every kind of move, you know. And so Cam Jordan is a guy I, I, I like a lot. And I feel like, uh, you know, when I, when I watch my own tape, you know, I kind of, you know, he's a guy I kind of measure myself up to a lot. A lot. I, I want to hear the flip side of the coin, though. I want to see the offensive linemen that have given you trouble. Who, who's given you the most trouble over the years in terms of when you go up against one-on-one? -on -one? Well, I used to always say Joe Staley back in our days when I was in uh, the Cardinals. We used to compete twice a year. And I just, I mean, he was, he was one of those guys where he was, uh, 
he had the, the mental part of it at a high level. He had, the, uh, you know, he's a great athlete, great technique, and he's going to be consistent. You know, we had some great battles over the years. Um, but I, I think uh, more lately, uh, I mean, it depends. You know, uh, I got a lot of respect for, uh, for, for um, uh, Lawan. I think he, uh, you know, you know uh, he's still young. He's still developing his, uh, his, his technique, but he's just a, he's a mauler. He's tough. You know, he's, he's, he's got a lot of heart to him. Uh, Joe Thomas was all, I mean, obviously he was one of the, one of the best uh, in the outside. Uh, I mean, Marshall Yonder from the inside, you know, he's, uh, you know, I, I really was hoping that he was going to come back for one more year. Because oh, yeah. uh, uh, he, he just, I mean, he does it, he does it all, both running and pass. Uh, he's just a complete player, tough, smart, you know. Um, I feel like you have to have, like, all of those together. Uh, I do think there's some good young players. I think uh, Larry Tunsil, you know, uh, he, he uh, impressed me this year. Honestly, I, I say that uh, he really earned a lot of respect for me this year. Uh, when he was younger, you know, I, I thought he was just okay, good athlete, you know, but he's really gotten a lot better, you know, and that's, that's good to see. You know, looking ahead to the season, and we'll close with this, you know, what, what are you hoping to make as an impact with the Baltimore Ravens this past year? A little bit older, bringing a veteran presence along the defensive line. What are some goals you have in your first year in Baltimore this year? I mean, honestly, uh, you know, uh, everybody's kind of in the same mentality. We all want to win the Super Bowl, right? You know, and um, I think about just the team. You know, we have, uh, you know, uh, with three all pros in the, on the back end. And uh, for D linemen, I think that's what you want to see. You know, somebody's going to give you that extra split second so those pressures turn into sacks. And uh, so, I mean, for me, like, I, I tell myself all the time, like, I can't really worry about getting sacks or trying to make plays. Just win. Win your matchup each and every time. And I, I try to teach that amongst my young, my young peers and stuff. And with Baltimore, I feel like we have a, a lot of young talent. I think Jared Wolf is a guy who uh, is both great in the run game and as a pass rusher. Uh, you know, I think Drew Don is, uh, is, is, I mean, just got a lot of range and very talented, you know, and uh, we've got some young guys. I mean, ooh, uh, uh, Big Baby, as they call him, Brandon Williams. I think, you know, he's had. You know, I didn't know uh, his nickname was Big Baby. That makes so yeah, much Big sense. Yeah, Big Baby. <laughs> that dude is massive. How? So I, I wanted to ask you this. I know I said we close, but you speak to you know, Marshall Yonda, Staley. These guys trim up when they retire. They get super, like they lose weight easily. Do you imagine Clayus Campbell, six foot eight, two ten or something when you retire? Are you <laughs> are you going full swim swimsuit bod or what are we talking? I uh, I tell myself that uh, you know, uh, to my knowledge, to go skydiving you have to be two fifty. So my goal is when I retire, I'm gonna go skydiving. <laughs> I can get down to two fifty. It's a good goal. I didn't know there was a weight limit to skydiving, actually. I guess that kind of yeah. makes sense. That, yeah, that, that makes sense. And I'm thinking about it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, um, Cleus, I really appreciate the time. really appreciate you coming on the pod. I would love to get you on maybe sometime in season, maybe on your way to a Super Bowl with the Baltimore Ravens. But, again, really appreciate your time, and best of luck moving forward. Hey, I got to give uh, Jason Peters a shout-out, too. I feel like I left him off the list, and I can't leave oh, him off the list. Man. That's, <laughs> <all the perfect. laughs> That's perfect. But, Sounds yeah, good, man. I, I appreciate you guys for having me, man.